Uh, we're excited about Easter coming up just a few days away, um, which means today I have the pressure of wrapping up our series on joy. So today is the last day of our joy. No, I said that wrong. Today is the last day of our series on joy. Okay, I got this. All right. So Paul writes this letter. We call it Philippians. It's, we call it a book. It was really a letter that Paul wrote to the Christian folks in the, in the, in the village or the, the city of Philippi, and he gives some instruction, and he has this overarching theme all throughout all four chapters of this letter about joy, about how big a deal joy is, about how important joy is, about how, how big a deal God makes of joy. So we're going to jump into today, Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to jump right into one of my favorite passages in the entire book, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Paul writes this, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. It's going to be one of those days, all right? So let me just get you ready. I'm, I'm going to get my little preacher on today. I say it again. I can't even get an amen out of that. Okay, thank you. Thanks for participating. I say it again. Y'all, come on. This is, we're going to practice, and you're going to think that's funny later on. We're going to practice until we get this right, because Easter's coming. We got to be excited about resurrection next week, okay? So I say it again. Amen. Rejoice. Amen. Okay, we'll stop there. <laughs> this wasn't just like best practice. This was Paul's statements. This was, it, it was this instruction of, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. When I was growing up, the little bit of church I grew up at, like we sang a song based off this one particular passage. Anybody remember? You know where I'm going with this? Now, we weren't a very big church and we didn't move very much, but when this song came on, come on now, grandma was getting the tambourine. No, she didn't get the tambourine, but she was, she was bobbing and moving. We got excited. Maybe you know the song, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Y'all didn't do it. The most exciting part of the song. It's, that was the exciting part for me. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Rejoice, rejoice. Nope, we're going that far today. Okay. We'll just pause right there. Paul was giving us what I believe wasn't just recommended best practice for Christians. I think he was giving us a formula to always be full of joy. To always be full of joy, you must always... Be in the Lord. Don't miss it. To always be full of joy, you must always be in the Lord. If you want to be full of joy, you must always be in the Lord. Week one, we talked about this. We are citizens of heaven. And because of we're citizens of heaven, we have, a, we have a claim, an expectation to the fullness of joy. I don't say this very often, but we, we have an entitlement through our salvation to the fullness of joy. And if I'm not full of joy, probably the indicator I need to dress is, am I full of the Lord? Because we can get lots, we can get full of, I don't know how to say this without sounding inappropriate. We can be full of lots of things and not be full of the Lord and not experience the joy that God has for us. For example, you're not going to be full of joy if we're full of getting the way we want. Man, I really just want what I want. And if I get what I want, then I'll be full of joy until I lose what I thought I wanted. And then what happens to my joy? Well, we can think that we're going to be full of joy when we get the promotion that we want, and I'm full of this promotion until the stress of this newfound level of responsibility kicks in. Well, we can think, I will be full of joy as soon as I get on a beach on vacation of spring break while the rest of us sit here in Indiana. It's 40 and gray. And if your joy is only found while you're sitting on a beach on spring break, what's it going to be like when you come back to Indiana and it's 40 degrees and it's gray outside? Where your joy go there? If our joy is only found in the circumstance, then we're not full of the Lord. We're full of the circumstance. And when the circumstance changes, we're no longer full of joy. If you're always full of the Lord, you have everything you need to be always full of joy. People are, people are great. It's, it's crazy, especially in our particular part of the globe. People are great at coming to Christ when crisis happens. If you go through the history of the church and the, the attendance trends, you can always see the spikes in church attendance because they always come right after a global crisis or maybe a more centralized crisis. People have a bad experience in life and they run back to Jesus because he helped last time. He gave me grace and peace last time. He gave me comfort last time. And as soon as they start to feel a little bit better about where they were, thanks Jesus, you got me again. I'll see you next time I fall into a crisis. Church, can I just offer this? What would life look like? What would joy look like? What would peace look like? If we just simply stayed full in the Lord all the time then I believe we would rejoice always. We would have joy all the time because here's what I believe to be true. To the Christian, joy is a choice. 
And it's not a choice as simple as, do you choose joy? It's as simple as, what do you choose to be full in? If I'm always full of complaints, I'm not going to have any joy. If I'm always full of pessimism, I'm not going to have any joy. If I'm always full of sass or offense, if I'm always full of criticism or comparison, if I'm always full of anger or resentment, I will find no joy, let alone always be full of joy because I'm always full in the Lord. The next verse, Paul continues. He says this, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. And if you're just kind of reading your daily Bible verse, you, you read the first verse of chapter four, always be full of joy. And then you read verse five, let everyone see that you're considerate. And then the second half of verse five, remember the Lord is coming soon. And that just seems like we just had like a chicken pot pie of different concepts. But if you understand the context that Paul's writing, he's bringing all of these things together to help us fully understand this sustained joy. Always be considerate, but let everyone see how you're considerate in all that you do. Considerate does not mean that you're a pushover. But being considerate does not mean people just roll over you. Being considerate simply means that you consider things, that you consider how this is going to impact someone. It means that you consider the consequences before you go through with an action. You consider what this might do to bring love or joy or hate and anger. You consider how these words are either going to bring life or they're going to bring death. You consider how these words will tear someone down or bring someone and build them up. You consider the impact of everything that we do when we consider. Consider it means that I've got a level head. Consider it means I don't just respond to spiritual things through my feelings. Consider it means that I am loving in all that I can do and do my best to display this love. And he didn't get specific in here to say, let everyone who's closest to you, let everyone who sits in the row with you, let everyone who's in your house, let everyone that's so close and thinks like you and believes like you and let everyone, he says, let everyone, even the people not like you, even the people that don't believe like you, even the people that don't live like you, let everyone see that you're considerate. Why is it so rare that people that claim to be of faith in Jesus have so little reputation of being considerate to people outside of the faith? Would they consider us to be considerate? We have this vision that I believe is God-given, this, this attempt to live out the 10K life. It's, it's 10,000 next steps with Jesus. It's a church that's intentionally pursuing him and taking steps closer to him. It's sharing the gospel with 10,000 people over the next few years, and it's 10,000 intentional acts of kindness. Do you know why I'm so passionate about something as simple as 10,000 intentional acts of kindness? Because the church, the followers of Christ, the believers in the body, we don't have a great reputation of being considerate of others. So we're going to have to be intentional about the fruit of the spirit of kindness overflowing in everything that we do to everyone that we interact with. Not only are Christians often not, or just maybe not as considerate as we should be, sometimes we're often very inconsiderate. I don't really care how this affects you. I don't really care how this hurts you. I don't care what you think, and I certainly don't care about your opinion. So the question I want you to wrestle with as we kind of get started today is, am I considerate in all that I do? And I'm going to go out on a hunch here, and I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Why not? Why am I not considerate in all that I do? Paul continues writing in the very next verse, but I need to pause here to explain because I think this makes a lot of sense. Paul continues in what we would read as the very next verse, but, but, but understand this. Paul didn't write his letter in chapters and verses. He sat down and he wrote a letter in chains, in prison, about to find out if he was going to get killed for his faith, for acting upon his faith. So in, in house arrest or in prison, he writes this letter. And we call it a book. And it's one of the 66 books of the Bible written by over 40 writers over a span of about 1,500 years. And about 200 years after Paul wrote this, about 200 AD, we find that they take all these scriptures that have been found and scholars bound them together in what we call the Bible. Old covenant, new covenant, all the scriptures, all the letters, all the eyewitness accounts of Jesus, all the predictions of who Jesus was and the fulfillment of so many of those predictions that came to place, came to be in hundreds of years, thousands of years to follow, all put together in this one amazing book. There are so many positives in this book. There, there's so many positives in binding this book together for our carrying convenience. People often ask, and maybe you've fielded this question before. People outside the faith often ask, how can you put all this faith? How can you put all this trust in one book? Can I just refute that real quick? It's not one book. It's 66 books bound together for your carrying convenience. 
You're not carrying around one book. You're carrying around a book written by one author, but penned by 40 different writers, all bound together, telling the story of creation, of creation of mankind, of redemption of mankind, of all of God's plans, so perfectly woven together right here in this library. Not just a book. 66 books. There are countless positives to why we have this book bound together. There are countless positives to why about 1,200 years after that, they went and they, they sorted through and they gave chapters and verses. So, so you could go back and you could quickly reference a specific passage. You can go and you can memorize a specific passage. You could go back and you could easily find and look through all these things. There are countless positives to why there's chapters and verses in your Bible. But I believe that there might be one harmful reason. I don't think it was wrong. It definitely wasn't intended, and maybe harmful is the wrong word. Maybe what I would just simply say is this made this so much better, but it also made the way for some scripture to be misused. I'll give you an example. You don't have to look at very many Instagrams. You don't have to look at very many tennis shoes or cleats of professional athletes to find scriptures that seem to reference something so powerful in the Bible. One of the most famous ones, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, a scripture we'll look about more at in here in just a moment. Philippians 4.13, if you know the scripture, says, For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We, we say it like a chant, like it's given me the right to do everything that I want to do. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It sounds so beautiful, but taken out of context, it's oh so wrong. What happens is because of the simplicity of the passage and our ability to go and to find the specific sample of the passage, we can go and we can pluck it right out of context and we can give it the meaning we want it to have and apply it the way we want to, building our faith the way we want it to sound. And so often Philippians chapter four has so many little nuggets that have been popped right out of context and labeled on something and completely derail people from the real and whole truth of the gospel. I'll give you another example. Um, you probably have somebody, if you're on social media, that you would consider a um, invasive poster. Like they put so much business out there, you're like, you need to back off. I don't even know that much about you. I don't need to know what, never mind. We'll just go on. There are people that post so much. And here's the thing, as much as they post, even the most invasive posters are giving you about 0.04% of their life. And the temptation is, for those of us that are watching this, is we'll take that 0.04%, that little commercial break, a little clip of their life, and we'll compare 100% of the visibility of our life. We compare their highlight reel to our 6.40 a.m. Get up, I told you three times you're gonna miss the bus. You ain't getting breakfast today. Come on, look at your hair and your teeth is a mess. Oh, but look at this Instagram post where it looks like they've got it all together and their husband looks way better than my husband and their kids seem so more behaved than my kids and all of these. And what we've done is we've taken a clip it from their life out of the context of their life and compared it to the fullness and the joy <laughs> of our lives. And when you take something out of context, context, you miss the meaning of the fullness of what they really are doing. There are so many positives about the chapters and verses in scripture. Don't mishear that. I recommend to people all the time, if you're gonna start reading the Bible, start memorizing specific scriptures. It's a great way to start. But if we don't understand the context that surrounds the scripture, we miss so much of the meaning of what we're doing. Another example of that, Philippians chapter four and verse six, a passage that get taken out of context. Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. And without the context of where this lies in scripture, we get up in the morning and we tell our anxious friends, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And then when the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month comes and they haven't worried, but nothing's changed, they freak out. I prayed, you told me to pray, I prayed. God didn't answer my prayers. Now I've got more worry than I started with. I've taken this out of context. I just stopped worrying altogether because that's what that one particular scripture said to do. There is so much power and so much truth in this passage. Don't worry about anything, but there's so much more context with it. Verse seven, Paul says, and when you do, thank him for all he's done. Verse seven, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. And if we miss the context of this, we miss how this really works. In the context of always be full of joy because you are always in the Lord, remember the context. Remember the context. Remember the Lord is coming soon. There are so many things we could eliminate from the worry of our life if we just remember the Lord is coming soon. 
Now listen, that's not in the Bible so that we freak out. There are Christians that hear, Jesus is coming back soon. What are we gonna do? Oh no, he's coming back soon. Here's the great news for you. And now he's coming back even sooner. You're, you're 30 seconds farther down the road. It's even closer. Paul doesn't give us this scripture to scare us because if you're always full of the Lord, you're not fearful of Jesus returning. He gives us his peace of mind because many of the things that we worry so much about, what if I don't get a house as nice as my neighbors? If Jesus is coming back soon, does my house size matter? If I don't dress as nice as everybody else on Easter Sunday, do I need to worry about that if I remember that Jesus is coming back soon? There are so many things in life. If I just remember Jesus is coming back soon and this really doesn't matter, but some things really do. He says, pray about everything, tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Do you know how Paul could say this while in prison waiting to see if he's gonna die for his faith? Because he didn't just say, pray about it. I'll confess for a long time in my pastoral career, people would come up and they'd be like, pastor, can you pray for me? And I would say, I absolutely will. And with the best intention, I'd even write it down on my list. I'd put it in the back of my mind. I will pray for you. I would say to them, I will pray for you. Paul didn't just say, I think we should pray. Paul prayed and he believed that he would pray. I've tried to make it a practice of mine that every time someone says, will you pray for me? I stop what I'm doing and I pray. If it's over a text, I'll text them a prayer back. If it's a phone call, I'll call them back. If it's in a face-to-face conversation, we'll step to the side. And I wanna make sure that I don't just say that I'll pray for you, but I live through, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that when my prayers go up, it's not just some power in the sky that maybe could hear it, but that God who sent his Holy Spirit to live in me will hear every word that I say and take understanding of pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. This word all, I don't think just limits to the things that have already happened because our God is not limited by time. God exists outside of time and space and matter. In order for him to create that, he has to live on the outside of it. So when we thank God for all he has done, we are not just thanking God for what he did in my past. We are thanking God for what he is doing all right now and all the things that he is going to do in the future. And it changed my perspective on how I see God. It changes my perspective on how I pray. So I pray like God can hear every word of my prayer. And I pray about everything. And I pray like there is power in the prayer that Jesus commands. So then, when I get to verse seven in context, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything we can understand. You wanna know how I don't worry? You wanna know how I get through a day without feeling anxious? You know how I experience the peace of God that far exceeds anything that I can understand? It's because I've learned to pray about everything. And I believe that God hears my prayers. And they aren't just some random words in hopes that some spirit will hear them, but knowing that the Holy Spirit will hear, that God will hear my prayer. And I tell him what I need. (laughs) Did you know that we don't tell God what we need to keep him in the loop? Like you don't get done with a good 30 minute prayer session with God and he is like, wow, Luke, I had no idea that's what you were going through. Thank you so much for filling me in. I feel like we're closer now because you have informed me of all the things that you need in life. Can I just offer this? When we pray and tell God what we need, what I'm really doing is releasing my desire to control the outcomes. I'm gonna say it again because I don't think you heard me. When we pray and tell God what we need, we're not praying to inform him of what we need. When I pray and tell God what I need, I'm releasing my desire to control the outcome. God, this is what I need and I trust if I really need it, you'll provide God, this is what I believe that I need. If this is not what I need, that I believe that you're gonna guide me in a different direction. God, I'm giving this to you. You wanna know how I can always be full of joy? Because when I pray and give it to God, I step back and say, you know what? I'm gonna do the best with what you've given me. And if it works out to the results that I desire, that's great. But if it doesn't, that's still good because I'm gonna trust that you have better timing than me and maybe you know a better direction than me and maybe you know what I really need, the results I trust up to you. So I'm gonna do my best with what you've given me. And if it works out, not so great, not the way I thought, not the way I planned. I'm good because God, I trust that you knew and that you were prepared and that you've invested way more in this than I have. And if things work out amazing, uh, remember last week, if things work out amazing, I'm gonna count it all as garbage. I'm gonna move it from the deposit category to the loss category so that I may know Christ and gain Christ. I'm not taking credit for it because the results aren't contingent on me and the timing isn't contingent on me and the impact isn't contingent on me. So I give it all over to Jesus. I, I don't worry about anything. Every day I get up, God, here's what I think I need today. 
And I thank you for what you've done, and I thank you for what you're doing, and I thank you for what you're going to do. And my spirit is light, and my burden is easy. People tell me all the time, with the most compassion, and I appreciate it, man, Pastor, I just I can't imagine the pressure you're under. I can't imagine how busy you are. People are so kind. They're so, so just generous. Pastor, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you're so busy. Yeah, it's part of the job. Like, I, I plan my calendar almost down to the minute every single day. I didn't ever expect to be this part of my life. I, I love freedom, but man, there's, to get things done in the way that need to be get done, I, I got a plan. And, and yeah, you, you can't imagine. I had no, um, no conceivable imagination to the pressure that comes with this job. Like there are days where I'm just reminded of, what'd you get yourself into? Not a day goes by that I don't pray and give everything that I need to God. Request what I need and give him thanks for what he has done. And what I've learned is on the days that I forget, and I try to do it on my own power, and I try to do it on my own agenda, and I try to do it under my own means, I can feel the pressure rising. So I step back, and I just say, God, thank you for what you've done. And I'll get specific. God, thank you for this and this, and thank you for doing this right now, and I'm thanking you for what's coming. And I get real specific and say, God, I'm giving all this to you. The results are on you. The timing is on you. The the preparation, I'll do my best with what you've given me, but this is all on you. And regardless of how the outcomes proceed, regardless of what comes from it, I'm going to be in joy and I'm going to be at peace because I know this wasn't up to me anyway. I'm going to trust God, not just to take care of today, but I'm going to trust God that the results of today that lead to to tomorrow's today are all going to fall into his plan and will. And when I don't think they're working out the way I want to, I just trust that, God, you know what you're doing. And I might not be able to see the things that you can see. And your plans are better than mine. And you can see farther into the future than I ever could. And you've been working on the behind the scenes for today for far longer than I have. And I step back. And even if it didn't work out the way I hoped, it didn't work out the way I planned, it didn't work out the way I expected, I still rest in the peace that exceeds everything I understand. And not only does this peace sustain the joy and will be filled with joy, but his peace, remember his peace is the peace that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So as we move forward in Philippians chapter four to another verse that's so lovely and plucked right out of context, we get to verse 13. Verse 13, Paul writes, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And if you get on social media, specifically with like some athletes, maybe some professionals or some college level, or even high school athletes, like we, we put this on our shoes, we put this on our jersey, we put it on our helmet, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And taken out of context, that really seems like permission to do whatever I want. And Jesus promises to give me strength. Now, I, I, I do my best to be a good dad. I'm not perfect. My, my kids have lists of all the things that I get wrong. They're so kind. I miss it. But I try my best to provide for my kids, to give them every opportunity that I can, to give them good opportunities. But can I just confess some of the things I've learned is some of the best parenting that I need to do is to tell my kids no, to not let them have that thing that they thought they wanted. I have this one particular kid, love her. She just has a sweet tooth. I won't tell you how old she is because this is embarrassing, but she would eat ice cream three times a day for meals and three times a day for snacks if we were to allow her. Like she loves her some ice cream. And as a dad, I want to provide for my kids. I want to give them all the desires that they want. But there are times where even as an older teenager now, I have to say, no, it's not good for you. No, that's not healthy for you. For crying out loud, you're lactose intolerant. That's not fair to anyone you're going to spend the day with. (laughs) I have one kid who for a season of life didn't want to go to youth group. They were a teenager. They weren't very connected. They didn't have very many friends that went to our youth group. And they were like, Dad, I don't think I'm going to go. And I said, no, you're going. Let me just hop on my soapbox for a minute. As a former youth pastor, let me just give you some advice. This is just heartfelt. This isn't scripture. I think it's Holy Spirit driven. I'll go with it. If you've got a young person, if you've got a young person in your home, and they were to come into you tonight and say, you know what, Dad? I'm just not really feeling algebra. Like I've been going for a little while. I feel like I needed to go, I'm not really vibing with the professor, I'm not really enjoying the, the homework. It's not fun, if I'm being real. Like, algebra is not fun. Um, so I, I'm just going to let you know that after spring break, I'm, I'm not going to go back to algebra. Um, I'm, just, I'm just not feeling I'm going to go. You wouldn't be like, well, if that's what you want to do, I don't want to force algebra on you. I don't want you to have to get a degree and move on. I don't, I don't, I don't want you to do things that you don't enjoy. If algebra is not fun, you just, no, what would you say? Well, I appreciate your opinion. Now get your homework done. You're going to algebra. Now I'm not saying force your kids to go to church. 
But there are times where we roll over way too easy on the things that are the most important. There are things where, there, there are times where our kids come in and say, well, none of my friends are at church tonight. I'm not going to go. You know what I said? Make new friends. There's some good people. Bring them with you. Listen, we, we can't just so easily allow our kids to do the thing that they want to do. God doesn't want you to just do what you want to do. Because usually what I want to do today is really going to impact in a negative way my tomorrow. And as a good father, he sees that this is the impact. That he considers this is what's going to, he knows this is what's going to happen. I'll be real practical with you. I had the biggest desire when I was in middle school and high school to be an NFL tight end. I've got the size for it. I've got the frame for it. I had really good hands. I caught almost every pass ever thrown to me. I was really feeling like I had good chances to get into the NFL as a tight end. But I worked at it, and I believed that, that I can do all things through Christ who give me strength. So I worked out, and I stretched, and I gained, and I grew. But no amount of strength would take what you call slow twitch muscles and turn them into fast twitch muscles. So I did not have the speed to play in the NFL. So I took the easy route, and I played basketball. Because basketball is not so hard on your body. But you know what I found out very quickly? Even though I wanted to make it to the NBA, I still got those same slow twitch muscles. So while I've got the speed of seven foot six, I've got the height of six foot four, and you ain't going to the NBA when you're as fast as a seven footer and the size of a shooting guard. I used to work really hard when I was in college. After realizing all those dreams had faded, I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I started studying all the pre-vet stuff. I started doing all the classes. I started working really hard. And after taking chemistry one, two and a half times, the vet schools lost interest. I didn't get any phone calls. I am not created to do everything that I think I want to do, which means Jesus isn't going to give me strength to do all the things that I want to do. That doesn't mean he loves us less. In fact, it means he loves us more. Because if I would have got in the NFL, I'd have a nice house. If I would have got in the NBA, I'd drive a nice car. If I'd been a veterinarian, I'd have both. <laughs> but I wouldn't be doing what I was created to do. And I missed it. And then we take it a step farther. Because I've been told, and because you've been told, and your kids have been told, that anything you want to do, Jesus will give you strength to do. We get onto social media, and we look at what everybody else is doing. And when I believed in my core that through Christ I could do all things until I see someone else doing all things better than me. And I was taught that I could do whatever I want. I can become whatever I want to become. And I see all these highlight reels on social media of people who look like they're way farther along than me and I'm not measuring up. And I worked so hard and I thought I'd be really good at this and look how much better they are in me. Look how much more mature they are in their faith in me. I thought I was gonna do this, but look at all these people, seven trillion people on planet earth and half of them are better than me. And I, you told me I could do all things? I can't do no things. And all of a sudden, we wonder where our joy has gone. You told me I could do all things and now I can't and people do it better. And our peace is not just disrupted, but it's corrupted. You talk about a spike in anxiety. You talk about a reason to live worrying about life. Let me think that I can succeed at something and let me watch everybody else on social media look like they've succeeded more. So let's put Philippians chapter four back in context. If we back up to verse 10. In verse 10, Paul gives this thank you to the church in Philippi. He says, thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for providing resources for me while I'm doing all this ministry. Then we get to verse 11. Paul says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I, I, I feel like I can camp here for the rest of the day, maybe even next week. If you want to always be full of joy, then we must learn the spiritual discipline of learning how to be content. If I could go back in time as a parent, there, there are several things that I wish I could tweak and do a little bit different. But maybe the number one thing I wish I would have done if I could go back in time is before ever introducing or allowing my kids to have social media was making certain that they had learned how to be content. Because if you get on social media without first learning the spiritual discipline of learning to be content, you will learn to hate your life. It's the world we live in. That's where we are. It's a real struggle to learn to be content. Paul says, I've learned, which means it's our responsibility, parents, to help our kids learn, which means it's our responsibility as followers of Christ to learn to be content. You wanna see how joy is sustained in your life? You wanna experience the peace that God offers? We have to learn to be content. If you're taking notes, number one, we have to learn. You're not born with it. 
We're, we're born with stealing from our little brothers and sisters. We're born with stealing from kids at, at preschool because we want more. But Paul says, no, no, no. If you want to follow Christ, if you want his joy and his peace, you have to learn to be content. Before I can get down two more verses to I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, first I need Jesus to teach me how to be content. Verse 12, he gives us some expan- an ex- explanation of this. Verse 12, he says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether I am with a full stomach or empty, whether with plenty or little. This adds a whole new layer of context to I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Because it isn't just anything my flesh desires. It's anything that fits into or disrupts me from or gets in the way of the call that God has got on my life. And I'm not frustrated or angry or disheartened or disappointed with how I compare or what I've achieved, what I've not yet obtained or what I haven't yet done because I've learned to be content. So my joy remains intact. I've learned to be content when I have and I've learned to be content when I am without. I've learned to be content when it's easy and I've learned to be content when it's hard. I've learned to be content when I've got plenty of resources. And I've learned to be content when I had to take out a loan just to pay attention. That was a way better joke than anybody laughed at right there. Let me put a little context in the verse. For I can do everything that God has called me to do through Christ who gives me strength. For I can press on to the race that God has set before me through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13 was not, you do you and Jesus got you, boo. No, it was, for I can fall into the will of the Lord. And no matter what gets in my way, whether I've got plenty or not enough, I can do all things in every situation, whatever is going on. The secret to living in any situation, are you full in the Lord? If so, Jesus will give you the strength to press on. Maybe the take home for some of us, maybe the take home for you today is to ask the question, well, why am I allowing the comparison trap to paralyze me with worry or fear or stress when I know that I can learn to be content and in doing so experience the joy that God has got for me? How can I learn to be content with whatever I have and in every situation? And as we work backwards A little bit lower, in in Philippians chapter 4, Paul doesn't just shed some light on how to learn to be content, but he gives us an instruction that will change the direction and trajectory of our life. Philippians chapter 4, backing up to verse 8. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then, if you're a highlighter in your Bible, you can't miss the then. Then the God of peace will be with you. His peace, remember? His peace is significant. His peace is the peace that guards our hearts and guards our minds. His peace is so significant, we can't even fully comprehend or understand it. So how do we posture ourselves to live full of the joy of the Lord? How do we posture ourselves to receive his peace? If you're taking notes, number two, I need to fix my thoughts. I have to fix my thoughts. Paul says one final thing. Hey, let me tie everything together. I've been writing you a letter. Let me tie it all together with this one final thing. He says one final thing. Don't forget this. He says one final thing. Hey, hey, pay attention right here. One final thing. Fix your thoughts. Now, I don't know that in Greek, in Bible Greek, like the word fix that Paul used has a little bit different meanings in two different camps, but I I love to take notice in English how important that is. See, here's the thing. At any moment, even the most mature believers, our thoughts can go rogue. You can be right in the middle of an amazing worship service like we were this morning, and a thought comes into your mind and takes you right out of the presence of the Lord, right to your grocery list, right to what you're doing tomorrow. You can be right in the middle of an incredible time of prayer and one thought goes rogue and takes you right out of it. Paul says, listen, when you notice, you need to fix your thoughts. It's both a warning and an instruction. It's a fix your thoughts, change them, but also a fix your thoughts, direct them. 
So how do we fix our thoughts? What do we fix our thoughts to? Remember week two, Philippians chapter two and verse five, Paul writes this. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus has. What's he was saying? Remember we talked about it. You must think as Jesus thinks and think about what Jesus thinks about. How do we fix our thoughts? We, we direct them to the way that Jesus thinks. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter eight and verse seven. Paul writes, he says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Another translation says, the carnal mind or the mind of the flesh is the enemy of God. We have to fix our thoughts. So the remedy to fixing our broken thoughts, the remedy to fixing our, our thoughts that need realigned or redirected, the, re, uh, the way that we fix or correct our thoughts is to fix our thoughts. All the English teachers talking about, wait a minute, what'd you do here? Well, let me give it to you. The remedy to fixing our thoughts is fixing our thoughts. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. The remedy to fixing our broken thoughts is to give specific focus to fix our thoughts on. And I don't believe Paul was giving an exhaustive list. Here are the things to fix your thoughts to, but man, what a powerful shift in perspective if we simply just started here. Paul's writing out of, out of real life experience. He's saying, listen, I've tried to fix my thoughts other way. And every time I did, I lost my peace. I was robbed of my hope and I have forfeited my joy. So he says, instead, fix your thoughts on what is true. What if we started right there? How many times do we worry about something that we're not even sure is true? Well, here's what I think they think. Is that true? Are you sure that it's true? Why are you worried about it? Well, here's what I'm pretty sure that they're saying about me. Are you sure that that's true? Why are you worrying about it? Well, here's what I believe about my past. Are you sure that that's true? Because I'm pretty sure last week Paul said, forget about your past. Press on to the future. How many times do we get all absence of joy because we aren't thinking about what is true? Think about what is honorable. Boy, in the world we live in, we love to tear people down. In this cancel culture, we are quick to remove people's honor. What, what if we just fixed our thoughts on what is honorable, on the qualities and characteristics of honor? on the people in our life that are worthy of honor, of our God who is worthy of all of our honor. Fix your thought on what is right. Fix your thought on what's pure. Fix our thoughts on what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. If you find yourself missing the joy that Jesus promised, he gives you the solution and the formula to get back to it. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts by fixing your thoughts. Last week, I got a little excited. I got a little ahead of myself. I got to point three a little too soon. We'll jump down to verse nine. We'll say it again. Paul writes, keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Last week, I said this. It was just on my mind. The Holy Spirit got all up in me. I was okay. If, if you're talking about practice, you're an athlete, you're a team. The mediocre teams will practice something, a drill, a skill, something specific. They'll practice it until they get it right. The great teams, the great athletes will practice it until they can't get it wrong. Way too many Christians want to do something one time and act like I've learned it, I've got it, I've read it, I know it, I'm good. Paul says, keep putting into practice. Enough so that I turned it into point three. It's just a repetition because practice is repeating what God instructs. So I have, I have to keep practicing what I've learned. And I have to keep practicing what I've read. And I have to keep practicing and keep putting into practice everything I've learned from these scriptures, chapters and verses. Everything I've learned in the context of who God says I am and what he's called me to do. I have to keep putting into practice the very things that God has set before me. If you want to experience this fuel called joy, and if you want to tap into the joy of the Lord, and if you want to operate in the fullness of joy, then keep putting into practice. What do we keep putting into practice? The entirety of the chapter of the book of Philippians, this incredible letter. Keep putting into practice, don't be selfish. Keep putting into practice, be humble. Keep putting into practice, don't try to impress others. Keep putting into practice, thinking of others as better than yourself. Keep putting into practice, taking interest in others. Keep putting into practice, stop complaining, serve beneath my station and carry with you the aroma of Jesus wherever you go. Keep putting into practice the disciplines to safeguard our faith. Keep putting into, black, into practice that I count everything else as loss and I move it over into the, to the debt category to keep it all uh, away from attention for me and away from honor for me, but pointing it all back to Jesus 
practice and to gain Christ. Keep putting into practice, no matter what happens, no matter what circumstance, I press on. And Jesus gives me the strength to press on for that which he called me to do. I keep putting into practice, eagerly waiting for Jesus. I won't waste the wait. I keep putting into practice, God, in the season of waiting, what image are you trying to impress upon me? What are you trying to develop in me in this dark room that I'm going through? I keep putting into practice, be considerate in all that I do. I keep putting into practice, I've learned to be content. I keep putting into practice, I will fix my thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Just keep putting it into practice. Going all the way back to where we started today. To be always full of joy in the Lord. What do I do? I put it all into practice. And I just keep practicing. And I say it again, rejoice. And pray with me. God, what an incredible gift that you have extended unlimited eternal joy to us right now. That regardless of circumstance and scenario, regardless of how things have worked out in the past, regardless of the bad things that lay in store right now today, and even while we wait, you promise your joy. God, help us to be a people that fix our thoughts by fixing our thoughts on the things that you offer. Help us to be a people that recognize when my thoughts get out of alignment with the truth that you have shared. Help us to be a people that are full of you so that we can walk full of joy. God, I thank you for that gift. It's in Jesus' name we pray.